Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It's my pleasure to have Craig Filek with us. Craig is the creator of Purpose Mapping. Craig guides smart, successful misfits in transition to clarify their purpose and create a path that lights them up. Craig's work is now focused on igniting the genius of teams as a competitive advantage. Billionaires, executives, founders, and innovative teams around the world seek Craig's guidance when making life-changing decisions. Craig, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. We know each other from a mastermind or a brotherhood called Metal. I know that you're adding a lot of value to Metal Brothers' lives and helping them to see their purpose. I'm curious to hear what your origin story is that got you so enamored by people's life purpose. I mean, <laughs> it, it all started when I was adopted at birth. There was just a long winding path of trying to figure out who am I and why am I here? And then of course, the question, what do I do about that? You know, I had a daughter unexpectedly in my early mid twenties and you know, the cycle with adoptees tends to kind of repeat as we try to work out what's the puzzle in our psyche. And so I spent a lot of time in the um, self-help, psychology, even metaphysical section of Barnes and Nobles on my nights off. And I just devoured, I mean, I've probably read over a thousand books and probably skimmed hundreds and hundreds more. And I eventually started stacking up literally probably about, I don't know, 20, 24 inches of, of uh, notebooks over about a 10 to 12 year period. As at the same time, I was going through Tony Robbins, Stephen Covey, you know, this was the time of Napster. And so I was just downloading massive amounts of information, trying to figure out entrepreneurship and what type of business would be right for me. And they were all talking about, you need a strong why, you need to know your purpose, you need to know your mission. And so I kept getting that, you know, everybody's talking about this, all the success, you know, people are talking about this. And then I'm reading personality profile stuff to try to figure out who I am, because I didn't really get the kind of mirroring that a lot of us, you know, would hope for uh, being raised. Something in that clicked. And I finally built the business that I set out to build in my 20s and it took about mm, 10 years to 11 years. And I realized I was miserable. And I ejected and uh, I sat up in a cabin up um, just north of Vermont. It was technically in Quebec, so south of Montreal. It was January and I sat there with that, you know, 20 inch stack of notebooks and I just read everything and I burned most of it. I ripped out a couple of pages here and there and I realized I've got a framework to structure and create the life of my dreams. But when I was in my 20s and I'm writing all those Tony Robbins lists of all the things I want to accomplish in my life, you know, and prioritizing them, I was too immature to know what to want. And so when I gutted out all the things I had created and just had the framework left, I looked at that and I said, yeah, I could use this to build something worthwhile. And I had learned so much about myself over those 10, 11 years that I finally knew what to focus on. And that became purpose mapping as a business, but also a framework for my own life. Do you ever regret burning all those notebooks? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time I've done that. I actually read about... Jim Morris, I was a big Doors fan in, in high school, and that's about yeah. as far as that went for me. But I read his biography, and he had done that. And, and I got back from college, and I, and I burned a stack of notebooks that I had accumulated up to that point. And, uh, and so I've probably done that at least twice, maybe three times in my life, and never look back. What does that get you? Burning the notebooks? Mm -hmm. Mindshare, bandwidth. It's just like defragging a hard drive for me. Okay. You never burned uh all your notebooks? No, I don't think no. I'd ever want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, I did. I saved. I still have a stack of notebooks that I um, specifically used for. I had a mentor for four years, and we spoke every week. He never charged me. He was just absolutely brilliant, and he was really um, the one who helped me. You know, there's there's an intellectual understanding of our purpose, but there's also just feeling at ease in our bodies. And he was the one that really helped me with that. And so I, ha I have all those notebooks. I didn't throw, I didn't burn those, but all the men's work and everything, you know, I, I kept all that. It was all the, you know, ideas and, and just trying to figure stuff out. It's like at a certain point, consolidate and move into the next phase of life. What else do you do to defrag your hard drive? I just went to see, um, do you know who Bob Weir is? Mm -mm, no. 
Bob Weir is the uh, youngest member of the Grateful Dead. And uh, so he just turned 75, I think, last Friday, so uh, October 16th. And he was playing in San Francisco, and I didn't go. I've never liked his solo stuff. And they just released a double live album from Colorado, and I was listening to it on my way up to the Tahoe area to go see my tiny house and, and visit a friend. And, um, and I'm listening to it, and I'm like, he's got a full band, slide guitar, piano, um, a double bass player, a cello player, a violin player, and a horn section. And the band was just in full flight. And I'm like, I would love to see these guys. And then they just happened to be playing in Reno two days later. A guy up in town, up in uh, the Sierras where I was, happened to have a ticket. I'm like, I guess I'm going. There's nothing like a Grateful Dead concert, man. <laughs> That's my all-time favorite. So I was just there last night, and I'm still a little bit kind of riding that cloud. I have no idea what that would be like. <laughs> you know, next year is their last tour, and I'm pretty sure they're coming to Florida. Uh, Dead & Company, where they have John Mayer as the, the Jerry Garcia stand-in. And I highly recommend it, man. If I make it out that way, I'll uh, hit you up and we can go because there's it, it's an American treasure. There's just no way to describe it, but it's not what people think. It's extraordinary mm. American music. I like John Mayer. Yeah. What, so what's the appeal to having a tiny house? You know, I had a 3,000 square foot French Tudor, 100 year old, you know, mini mansion in upstate New York. And, you know, thousand plus books in my library. I mean, just crates of stuff that I had been saving since high school for what? I don't know. It's to, to accumulate some sort of sense of identity. I hated upstate New York. You know, one of my mentors, actually, you may know Jay Samet from Metal. From, mm -hmm. uh, the yep. Group. We know each other. You know, and he literally in his book, Disrupt You, he calls it Rochester. By the way, he was a guest on this podcast. I'll put a link to that episode in the he's, show notes. He's one, he's one of my mentors and one of my heroes as well. And, you know, he calls it Rochester think when you invent the digital camera and then shoot yourself in the foot with it, like Kodak, right? <laughs> and, ah, that'll never be anything. <laughs> so it was rough, man. It was, uh, if you want to live in the year 1982, move to Rochester, New York. It's, it's just permanently 1982 there. And so um, raised my daughter to launch, you know, lots of Montessori up through sixth grade and just, you know, entrepreneurial thinking. And she finally uh, graduated high school. And I said, I'm out of here and dumped everything, sold what I could, gave away what I couldn't and threw away the rest and uh, packed up my truck and headed west. You know, I built a tiny home. Just It's just minimalist. It's just, you know, just keeping things very, very succinct. You know, a good example is um, Steve Jobs always wearing black turtlenecks, right? Or Zuckerberg wearing, uh, what does he wear, like gray hoodies. Mm -hmm. It's just a cognitive load that you don't have to carry, right? It's a house and stuff. It all has to be managed. It all takes up mind space. Yeah. And so now that I'm done raising my daughter, empty nesting, I kind of drove up the Rockies down the coast the last three years and landed in the bay. But I don't have anything you know, um, weighing me down and I can just focus on my purpose and just focus on what I'm building for the world. So that's the appeal of a tiny house It's just less to manage. And if you get tired of it and you need to defrag that, you can, it's easier to burn, I guess, I suppose. It's all wood. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like an art studio. It's like a, it's like a hot yoga studio on wheels. Actually, it's all tongue and groove inside and it's got a little tiny wood stove and it's got maple hardwood floors. And it just it reminds me of my yoga studio from back in New York. Let's talk about purpose mapping. I understand the process uh, firsthand from you walking me through it. And I'm holding in my hand right now for our listener who can't see it um, because they're not watching the video. It's a purpose map for me. The process that we went through was really awesome. So I want our listener to understand listener slash viewer to understand what the process is like, what you get out of it, how to embark on this themselves with probably your help, I would imagine. It's almost impossible for me to, to explain to somebody the experience they'll have, right? I can say you end up with a one page plan, right? Where your purpose, your reason why, and then your vision mission milestone kind of brings that dynamo down to the level where you can actually execute on it. But the process itself is, it's a process of painting your shadow or your blind spot into a corner, right? We look at your ways of being that feel best, your essence, the things you do that feel best, put you in flow. Those are your strengths. The things you do that feel worse, your downfall. 
And then what that leaves are the ways of being that feel worse, the shadow. And as Joseph Campbell would say, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. I think in alchemy, they say there's, I can't remember the, the Latin phrase, but it basically stands for in filth it is found, right? It's in those places that we don't want to go, that we hide, repress, and deny where that sliver of divinity lives, right? That, that, that spark of, of creation that, that really is our source energy. And it lives in the last place we would ever want to look. And so supporting somebody to get there in a way that doesn't trigger some kind of trauma response or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, psychological reaction is a really delicate process. You know, uh, some of the men in metal have referred to me as surgical precision, you know, empath and the ability to kind of just go in and just, you know, pluck the gold out of the shadow. And then when we connect that to your strengths, that liberated energy, attention and power fuels the development of our strengths and pushes us just 4% beyond our comfort zone. That's what we know from fMRI brain scans puts us in flow. And so when we're leaning into our strengths, the things that put us in flow with that little bit of extra energy, attention, and power, we're able to click into a flow state, which is how we realize our purpose. Some would call it our zone of genius, whatever you want to call it. It's that feeling of I'm fully alive. I have no questions about who I am, why I'm here. I'm having an experience of, yes, this is clearly why I was born. And it's it's extraordinary. It's remarkable. And then we craft a life plan around that, a project, a mountain to climb over the next three to five years that requires us to ignite our purpose in order to achieve it. And that structural tension is what holds us in a dopamine producing framework that gets people out of lethargy, melancholy, depression, you know, I work with a lot of people that are either at the top of their game, have sold businesses, and they're kind of like, I just want that spark back. I want that that drive and that hunger. And what we find is that we have to create a bigger goal than they've ever imagined and get super precisely focused. And then all of a sudden their brain starts working on like how they're going to achieve it. I'm curious from your experience, because it's been, you know, three weeks or so, how is that working for you since you got clarity? My shadow is selfish didactic and arrogant. Thank you for owning that publicly. That's yeah, brave. Yeah. yeah. So feel free to use that against me, all my enemies. <laughs> the gold in that is generous, perceptive humility. If I can find it in myself to be humble, to calibrate to people and where they're at in that moment, instead of trying to preach and teach and <laughs> coach them all the time, my wife especially dislikes that when I'm coaching her and she didn't ask for it. Um, and if I'm generous to a fault instead of selfish, then that's where I'm in this expansive state. And it feels amazing. If I don't focus on that aspect of it, if I'm not honest with myself and what my shadow is, and I'm just focusing on my strengths of being intuitive and strategic and so forth, I miss the gold. So read your purpose statement, the, the one at the top with the three lines. I'd love to hear that again. Okay. My purpose is intuiting benevolent connections by creating, coalescing, and transforming with generous, perceptive humility. That's a <laughs> mouthful. But the, the part that our listener will have already heard is that generous perceptive humility, that was the gold. Intuiting benevolent connections, that's just a strength of mind, being connected to intuition, acting with benevolence, having that always in my mind, like how do I re reveal light in this moment, and making connections. I'm a super connector. I'm a, you know, just part of who I am. And that's not really networking. It's more like finding the opportunities and almost like a conductor of an orchestra, bringing them together at exactly the right moment. That's just something that I'm gifted with. And then creating, by, by creating, coalescing, and transforming, that's, that's kind of the how. Those are more uh, doing type strengths of making the connections and the benevolence happen through acts of creation, of coalescing, integrating concepts together, ideas, strategies, and tactics and all that. And then transforming because it's not information that makes people happy and fulfilled. It's transformation. It all makes a lot of sense to me and helps me to be clear on what's in the path and what's off path. Right. And that clarity, right? We can't hit a target we can't see. And so when we've got X marks the spot on the map, we know exactly where to dig. We're much more efficient and effective 
because we have limited energy as human beings. We can only apply it right so much in a day. And when we're applying it to our highest leverage activities, a lot more happens a lot more quickly and we get that dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin that we're wired to seek. So that's, that's what I, you know, I, however that came to me, I mean, it was a 25 year process. I mean, I was a philosophy major at UW Madison. That's when I began this process of trying to figure out what is this all about? Like, why are we here? What are we mm -hmm. doing? And how do we live a great life all the way back to the ancient Greeks and, you know, the Lao Tzu and Vedas and all of this, you know, I was, that, that's what I studied and just trying to boil that all down and then bringing it to modern day with Brian Tracy and Tony Robbins and Covey and Kiyosaki and Michael Gerber and all these guys and it's the same stuff over and over and when you boil all that down when you burn all the notebooks and you just have that one pager left of that's my plan and i can make decisions based on this things go exponential pretty quickly so i'll be curious to check in with you a year from now two years from now and see how your mission project is going i don't know if you knew this but we have a uw madison in common is that right yeah, yeah right on. i have a master's degree from there in right biochemistry uh-huh yeah, such a beautiful campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever uh, steal a uh, cafeteria tray and go sledding down Bascom Hill? <laughs> no, I haven't. I hadn't and 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 won't. <laughs> but uh -huh. yeah, sounds like fun though. Kind of like cow tipping. I never did that either. I, I, yeah, I never got into that. <laughs> no, seemed seemed a little uncompassionate for the cows. Somehow yeah. that didn't that didn't resonate for me. So. How, how, let's talk about your shadow. How did you discover what it was? Uh, did you read Debbie Ford's book, I think? On, on, uh... Yep, some Debbie Ford. Really, for me, shadow work first came to light. I was 18. <laughs> no pun intended, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Uh, I was 18. I, I went to uh, Rochester for school and I had a really messy breakup in high school and ended up seeing a therapist who s just told me about the Mankind Project. Are you familiar? No. So it's one of the oldest and longest standing men's work organizations um, for listeners. They can go to mkp.org, Mankind Project. And I think there's like 50 or 60 or maybe at this point, 80,000 men around the world that have been initiated in this weekend. And then um, you get a men's group and you know you have men's circles that can last years, decades, which really is just profound, right? And a lot of it comes out of uh, the work of men like Robert Bly, who is a poet, Michael Mead, I think James Hollis. And there's a bunch of kind of Jungian, quasi-Jungian poets and, and therapists that were, that were authors that sort of coalesced into uh, the men's movement. So there was a lot of, you know, we did sweat lodges and there was a lot of psychodynamic work where we were bringing out some of the, you know, head trash and sort of replaying it and, and giving it a different ending where we were the ones that succeeded. You know, it was a lot of obviously childhood trauma type stuff where, you know, we couldn't defend ourselves or we couldn't, you know, overpower what was, uh, you know, what was overwhelming us. And so as adults, we could kind of replay that with props and things and, and rewire the story and then be witnessed in that and then integrate it with these weekly men's circles and learn additional tools and just a profound experience, especially at 18. I think it was actually probably a little bit over my head, but the men's circle that I ended up in really uh, it gave, it gave me a sense of what was possible for my life. So that was, that was amazing. That's where I learned about shadow work. And, you know, just based in, in Carl Jung. Now, Jung and Freud, and we'll, we'll get to mine personally in just a second, but I want to give the listeners a little sense of, of where this comes from. So Freud was a 19th century materialist, and he started getting into the unconscious and, and determined that there were a lot of hidden, repressed, and denied aspects of self, memories, you know, just all the creepy crawlers. He said, you know, that's the shadow. It's just all of the, all of the stuff from childhood, repressed, you know, urges to, you know, hit our brother over the head and take his candy and things that we couldn't do. And Jung was his protege for a long time. And, um, and eventually they, they separated really uh, around this point that Jung said, yeah, all that stuff's in there. And there's this incredible wellspring of creativity and resourcefulness and just power. And that's also in there. And so Jung spent his life working on excavating that and helping to bring that to light. And so that's where all of this really comes from. And then Joseph Campbell, who was a more modern day, um, you know, he helped with the first three Star Wars movies, which are why they're so profound. But you think of the hero's journey. He, he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's just this story of this archetypal psychodrama that plays out over and over and over. 
think of the matrix you think of um star wars harry potter right there's a a hero that is out of place, right? Luke Skywalker is living in a hole in the sand. Neo is computer programmer, has no idea what's going on in his world. Harry Potter lives in a closet under the stairs. And all of a sudden they go on this magical ride that takes them way out of the world that they were, you know, in. And they discover, you know, powers and helpers and they face, you know, dragons. You know, Lord of the Rings is another great example. Or even the Wizard of Oz, right? The Wicked Witch of the West and all this. And they overcome it. And then they have to integrate that. And then they have to bring that whatever, you know, they call it the elixir of life, right? The hero has to bring that back to their people. And then that's how they renew humanity. And so Jordan Peterson is kind of like our modern Joseph Campbell, if that, you know, listeners are familiar with him. Um, not all of his stuff, but a lot of his earlier stuff and some of his Harvard lectures you can still find on YouTube are brilliant with this sort of thing. So I just got really sold on it, you know, that there's something I don't, see about myself, it's hampering me, right? I'm, I don't have all of my power online and just worked with that for decades, you know, with coaching, training, therapy, workshops, all these sorts of things. Um, and ultimately got to the point where I was able to see through all these personality profiles, they all kept saying, look, here's what you're great at. Here's what's amazing about you. And these are the things that if you do them are going to take you out of your flow state and here is the way of being that is what you're hiding, repressing and denying. And when I saw that over and over and over, you know, when we did your process, you kind of just got a sliver of the, the larger arc of purpose mapping where we used a, a mastermind to help you come up with the keywords that go in, in each of these sections of your map. But usually what I'll do is a half a dozen personality profiles and an anonymous 360 and, and just distill all that down into that one pager. So there's a lot less kind of guessing and feeling around inside. There's a lot more corroboration from uh, objective resources that just keep pointing at the same things. And so my By shadow- the way, is, that was such an amazing process that I experienced uh, that you facilitated having, I don't know how many people, maybe six or seven other metal brothers who were contributing in the chat and just speaking into the Zoom call. The distillation that they were hearing from my explanations around things that triggered me or things that I was passionate about, et cetera, that was really, really cool. And some people I'd never heard uh, speak before, they'd never heard me speak. Um, there were some people there also that were friends uh, of mine from metal. I just got so much value out of that. Never experienced anything like that. All the personality profiles I've done have been just me filling out a form. Yeah. So, so this kind of unlocks the potential of, you know, you read about yourself in all these different personality profiles, but when you stack them all right in like a scatter plot, you start to see a through line. Like they're all pointing you in the same direction. And, you know, I use personality profiles from different cultures, different time periods. I mean, it's, it's uncanny how they can all somehow point you in the same direction. And one of the things I like to say is awakening is a one-way street and everybody that I've worked with, I'm not saying everybody on the planet, cause I don't know, but everybody I've worked with and I, and I have a hunch, you know, almost every human is heading the wrong way down a one-way street. And so to turn ourselves around and say, Oh, all of these things that I thought were natural for me were just habituated conditioning. And I actually have to turn around and do the hard thing and lean, you know, that 4% beyond my comfort zone and keep leaning in. And that's where I come fully alive. It's not as intuitive because we've been trained to do things that are more socially acceptable or that our family or school or religion or whatever wanted from us. And it, it kind of whitewashed what we were you know, the, the patterns and the, and the natural expression that we would have if we were raised as Maria Montessori would say, you know, if, if, if we follow the child, we will see their natural potential and patterns emerge. If I went to Catholic school and I had eight years of sit in your seat, raise your hand, don't say that, don't do that. And all of that natural expression just gets repressed. Right. And so when I do one of these sessions, did you ever get your knuckles wrapped with a, with a ruler? man verbally <laughs> <laughs> it gives me a lot of compassion for my mother because i think that maybe i don't know what happened to her she will never tell me i don't think it was anything 
hugely egregious, but for the time, you know, it was like, you know, wrapping knuckles, that type of thing that was kind of acceptable. Right. And so I got the trickle down of like, it wasn't that bad, but it was, you know, and I think we do that for our kids. We try to filter and titrate, you know, the, the traumas that we experienced and then they find their own traumas somehow. But, um, you know, it just gives us more compassion when we realize everybody has a shadow, everybody has a downfall, right. Then I'm not going to use it against you because then you can use mine against me. What I'd rather do is, is bear my soul and say, hey, how can we work together? How can we form a super organism, a mastermind, a spirit of harmony? You know, going back to the Napoleon Hill stuff, I still go back and listen to that. I'm starting to get better than ever what he means by a team working with a, a clear, you know, major purpose in a spirit of harmony. And that's what I do now with teams is everybody in their zone of genius or we don't do that project. We park it until we have somebody that ignites, you know, the full potential to do that with our team. Or we pick something else where we can all be in our zone of genius together. And it's extraordinary what happens. So I don't want to shirk my uh, invitation to share my shadow. I, we were right there and I, and I just don't want to like, you know, let that kind of slink by because it will, right? The shadow is oh, very, I'm not going to let it slink very by. <laughs> slippery. So, so my shadow is a manipulative narcissist addict. And my goal that comes out of that is mountains of innocent possibility. And when I connect that with my strengths of creating, illuminating, and gamifying, what I get is my purpose is drawing forth light by creating illuminating games with mountains of innocent possibility. So how have you done that today, for example, besides doing that in this podcast interview? How have I done that today? I haven't done that today. Um, this is my first thing that I've done today for work. Um, most of my day was just, well, is that true? So I was up in Reno last night. Now I'm down in Tiburon. And so I had a, a bit of a drive at 7 a.m. I work with my CTO twice a week and we create, you know, the, the software that we use to, to create your map. And, um, and so we're working on how, how can we bring that to millions or potentially hundreds of millions of people? So we're working on purpose.ai, which if that, you know, intrigues your listeners, they can go to purpose.ai slash optimized, and they can apply to be a beta tester for purpose.ai, and they can get access to uh, very similar content to what I took you through. I mean, I, I, you know, hosted you and took you through it, but they can get access to videos and things that will take them through it as well. And they can create a one page map and print it out just like you did. So that's, that's pretty cool. So that, that's the thing that, you know, the larger arc, that's my mission, right? Is to create purpose.ai. Eventually it'll be in the metaverse and augmented reality, you know, glasses and all this fun stuff. But right now we're just trying to get some of my coaching into an algorithm so we can reach a lot more people with it. So that would be one example of how I want to draw forth light from millions of people by creating illuminating games, which would be the purpose mapping process with mountains of innocent possibility. Like, man, this would be so cool. And just holding that pose, right? Just uh, as we would say in men's work or in yoga, it's just hold that pose. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's challenging. Lean in 4% more. And if I do that consistently, Right? There's an exponential curve uh, that we see in any like good to great, right? Any successful business, it'll just hit this kind of hockey stick. And if we build the right structures and team around it and everybody's aligned, I think that can be maintained. So, so that's how I'm doing it in general in my life these days. And I worked with my CTO this morning and now I'm talking with you. Well, that certainly counts as working towards your purpose. Uh, that's awesome. And, you know, it's not that dissimilar for what, from what I think of as I go about my day is how am I going to reveal light in this moment? So you're drawing forth light. I'm revealing light. Sounds pretty similar. Yeah. And it could be going outside in the backyard and feeding the ducks and the geese because we were on a lake. Could be having a conversation with my wife or with my, my little son or my mother-in-law. It could be talking to a friend, a colleague. But if I have that intention, then... I'm going to get a, a better, more profound outcome out of the interaction than if I just show up. Show up with a powerful intention at your family reunion, you will end up with a more powerful outcome than if you just showed up. That's right. And I like to, I like to break that down to, it's dopamine. <laughs> it's dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin. I mean, what, what are we really after? Our goals are just sort of um, like desktop clickable icons 
for something that runs in a process that is deeply unconscious for us that produces these feel good neurochemicals. And that's ultimately what we're after. So showing up, you know, with your wife and having a conversation where you're more grounded and centered and attempting to, you know, reveal the light, you can have an epiphany, you can share an epiphany, right? And you get that kind of endorphin umbrella and that dopamine glow. And it's just wonderful. So I just like to, I like to really simplify it, right? Because there's so much, you know, go for all this stuff and all these things, but it's, we're after dopamine and there's a specific way to create it. It's to have a clear intention and then to lean in and do the challenging thing. And that will produce dopamine. I think it, there's a dopamine addiction that people get from scrolling on their phones and wasting time on social media and on, on Netflix and other streaming services. Mm -hmm. that, the serotonin oxytocin part of that's missing. It's just the dopamine novelty factor mm -hmm. and not the meaningful connections and the feeling of fulfilling purpose. Yeah. I think that part's missing. Really important our listener understands that it's not just about dopamine. No, the oxytocin is that feeling. It's love. Right? It's what we call love. And serotonin is just feeling all right in, in our bodies, in the world, like feeling like where we belong and like we're part of something and we're okay. And I literally, I mean, every single quarter without fail, I go as far out into the woods as I can get up in the Sierras or out in the desert in the middle of nowhere in Nevada or, you know, wherever I'm going to go. And I take a, a, a tarp and a mat and a bag and a bottle of water and, and nothing else. And I just go out and I lay under the stars for three nights and I detox and I let my brain relax and reset. And, you know, I was a, a week late. And defrag. And defrag, right? That's another way I defrag. I was a week late uh, for this past thing. I tried to do them on the solstices and equinoxes. And I was a week late and I could feel it. I was getting cagey. It's like my brain needs that, you know, that, that uh, cyclical reset. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for anybody listening, I, I highly encourage, I was talking to a client who's, who's got more money than God. And I said, you know, I just told him I did this. He's like, I think I would be bored. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly the, go get as bored as you can get and like, let your brain reset itself. Uh, it's just incredibly healthy because we're completely addicted to our phones and it's toxic. Yeah, I finally, for the fifth or 10th time, deleted Facebook from my phone. <laughs> yeah. And this time I'm sticking to it. Yeah. So yeah, no more uh, wasting time. On, if I, I'm not wasting time if I'm standing in line at the grocery store waiting for my turn at the checkout. I don't need to maximize that that moment right. by doing some email or or doing some uh, social media thing. I can just be there and smile at people. Get some oxytocin going, you know, just, yeah. just have a conversation like a normal human being. That's the real concern. I mean, you know, we're, we're old enough that, you know, we didn't have cell phones all growing up, but these kids, especially through the pandemic, you know, where they're just glued to their phones, they're so awkward. It's like, they don't know how to create that type of oxytocin bond. Mm -hmm. That's a little concerning. For society. Yeah. We're in a world now where you have to get permission to make a phone call to somebody by texting them first. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's bad etiquette. It's a strange, strange world. I see people who are sitting next to each other and they're on their phones, both of them. They could be in conversation with each other, right. but they, they're facing their phones instead of each other. Yeah. It's just not, it's not healthy. And uh, then you get numb to the opportunities to reveal light just by simply saying hello. Right? You could be standing in line on your phone, scrolling through Instagram, or you could be standing in line saying hello to each of the people that are next to you. There's something, there's something, I mean, I experienced it last night, right? So I'm at the concert and I'm up in the, near the front, you know, I probably had half an hour, 45 minutes before the band came on. And so I'm just chit chatting with people around me and I don't know these people and you know we obviously have something in common we have a passion for this music a lot of us have a history of decades long of seeing the band at different places and wherever but what i found over and over was that i would start off kind of like eh, i don't really vibe with this person and if i gave it five minutes if i gave it 10 minutes we eventually kind of found a groove and all of a sudden we're like best friends and we're laughing and we're relating and it takes a little bit of, you know, in the flow cycle, right? There's resistance 
that then releases into the flow state. And so again, that 4% beyond our comfort zone, I try to leave my phone in the, in the truck when I go into the grocery store, just to kind of give myself a, a, a shot at maybe having a connection with a human being, because I'm not going to be tempted to just grab it and start scrolling for the three minutes while I'm standing in line. You know, there's an opportunity to connect with people there. So yeah, setting our, for you. you know, up for success. And so, yeah, there's something, it's, it's really, I think if you guys take nothing from this podcast, it's everything we want really is just 4%. That's the neuroscience beyond our comfort zone in the direction of something that, you know, we know has a payoff for us. So, you know, for me, it's like, I don't know if I was to go swimming out into the middle of uh, San Francisco Bay, right? 4% beyond my comfort zone would swiftly turn into the danger zone. <laughs> so it's not always just any activity, but activities that we enjoy, you know, there's, there's a resistance period and we have to push through that. And then in the release, that's when the dopamine starts flowing and all the rest yeah. of the neurochemicals cascade from there. I'm going to bring out a word that you shared just briefly, maybe 15, 20 minutes ago. I want to unpack this and, and uh, juxtapose it against the shadow. Mm -hmm. And the word you used was downfall. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? What, what's the downfall versus the shadow? Yeah. Why is this difference significant to our listener? Yeah, great question. So, so what I have identified in, and you know, I'm not the first person to identify this, but, um, there's a being side and a doing side to our human experience. And there are ways of being that feel better, ways of being that feel worse. Things we do that feel better, things we do that feel worse. So the ways of being that feel better, that's our essence. Things we do that feel better, those are our strengths. The things we do that feel worse are our downfall. And the way of being that feels worse is our shadow. Now there's an emotional content to each of these. So the way of being that feels best Emotional content is joy or bliss. It's like, oh yeah, this is me. This is the real me. This is the guy I want to be all the time. The emotional content of our strengths is actually fear. It's that resistance that we have to lean into that releases into flow. It actually doesn't start off with dopamine. It starts off with adrenaline. That's what brings us fully present in our bodies. Then the dopamine starts flowing, then endorphins, anandamide, serotonin, and oxytocin. Now, when we get down to the downfall, the things we do that feel worse. The emotional content there is anger, anxiety, depression, dissociation, and ultimately it's guilt. I wish I hadn't done that, right? I wish it wasn't doing this. And then the emotional content of the way of being that feels worse, our shadow, is shame. And so the difference between shame and guilt is guilt is I've done something bad. Shame is I'm bad. Right. So this is as parents, right? We don't say good boy. We say good job, good effort. I like the hustle. I like the way you leaned into that. Right. It's nothing about the beingness. It's just about the effort and the behavior. And that's what creates a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And so it's just the difference between shadow and downfall is, is being versus doing. And did you learn this from a particular book, the downfall versus a shadow? Well, the, the emotional content piece, I think I got that from Brene Brown and I just like the way that she summed it up. So, you know, I've kind of synthesized all these different things, the model itself, the being doing better, worse, right? That, that map of psychological wholeness where we get the gold out and connect it to our strengths. That's my own creation. Everything else is kind of synthesized and cobbled together, you know, vision, mission, milestone. That's not. That, that's everybody. That's just basic business, you know, uh, strategic and project planning. Um, but, yeah. but getting the purpose statement, you know, that that's my own creation. And I think I got the, um, the distinction between the emotional content of shadow and downfall from Brene Brown. Now you, you mentioned earlier, you've read a thousand books. Mm -hmm. Did you speed read them? Did you take some sort of, uh, course on how to speed read so that you could get through that many books or like how? Well, some of them I've read multiple times. A lot of them were on audio, right? I mean, this is, remember Zig Ziglar, Automobile University used to talk about that when you're driving in your car, like the radio is not making you better. You know, I've been, I've been in sales most of my career because what are you going to do with a philosophy degree, right? Like study people and, and motivation and things like that. So I got into, you know, Zig and Brian Tracy and all these guys, and I would walk out of the library every two weeks with a stack of, you know, uh, programs on cassette, you know, like six cassettes in a, in a, you know, a shell. And, you know, I'd have them up to my chin. I'd be walking out. So a lot of them were on audio. 
a lot of them, uh, yeah, I did study something called photo reading which is mm -hmm. fascinating, right? But I'm not a good speed reader. I actually read very slow. And so I could spend, you know, an hour reading a page and really deeply considering it. So I don't know that I've read, you know, cover to cover every single one of those books. But when in, in photo reading, it's kind of like you kind of go through and, and sort of snapshot, right? It's almost like a scanner, getting it into the deep subconscious. And then I would just have them on my shelves and I could just walk up to a book and open it and bam, there was the paragraph I needed or the, you know, couple of pages I needed. So I extracted, you know, in the 80, 20, 20, 20, you know, the value, the highest value stuff, because most, most particularly business books and, and a lot of books are, are mostly chaff, but I would go, you know, where, where's the real you know, nourishment in this and get right to it. Well, which books out of those thousand were the most pivotal? and which would be the ones that our listeners should most check out. So I just gave a presentation for D. Amandis's book flow on Ken Wilber's Theory of Everything. And so I think Theory of Everything is, is just absolutely required reading for anybody who remotely considers themselves in the personal growth game. It will rehang your consciousness. It'll be, you know, it's like Marie Kondo, you know, the magic of tidying up or whatever that book is, right? Yeah. She's like, life changing magic of tidying. That's up. right. Take all your drawers and dump everything on the floor, and you literally touch everything and, and, and you resort it. That's what theory of everything does for your head. You take everything you think you know and you dump it out, and then it magically rehangs your consciousness. And everything that I do is built on that framework. So I was a founding member of the Integral Center in Boulder about, geez, 10, 12 years ago. Lots of practice, you know, applied practice of integral theory. So I'm a, a really a big believer in that. Um, other books, particularly the Jungian side of things, uh, particularly around shadow, there's a book that I love by Robert A. Johnson. Um, I think everything by him is extraordinary. He was Carl Jung's youngest student. He lived in San Diego until well into his 90s. I think he only died in the last five, 10 years or so. And so he, he produced a lot of very modern interpretations of myths from the 1200s, 1300s, where he showed you know, that, that switch into modern society, where they, we had water wheels and you know, the devil's bargain and trying to get more than the world actually provides and, and what that does to our psyche and our, and our feminine feeling function. So there's a book called Owning Your Own Shadow, or maybe it's just Owning Your Shadow by Robert A. Johnson. But I think everything by him is, and they're all like 100 page books, and they're so succinct and so extraordinary. I recommend getting them used in hardcover because these are books for your great, great grandchildren. Um, that's how profound they are. I think one that I actually just gave to a, a friend of mine, he's in his sixties and he was re -roof, he's, a, he's a contractor. He was re-roofing his house up in the Sierras where I was visiting my tiny house, fell off the roof, broke his pelvis. And he was saying, you know, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like people are coming every day out of the woodwork, coming to my house and just sitting with me and bringing me food. And, you know, we're, connecting in a way that I've never experienced. And so he's getting the gold out of the shadow, right? Um, but I brought him a book that was in my tiny house. I thought, you know, he might like this while he's laid up. It's called Wisdom. How many books can you have in a tiny house? <laughs> um, I have my, um, my thousand books and I only kept 200 of them, but I only brought about 40 or 50 of them with me when I left New York. So a bunch of, there's a big duffel bag full of books still at my a friend of mine's uh, and all those journals I mentioned earlier. It's called Wisdom of the Enneagram. Check it out. I think it's, it's uh, you know, as far as typological profiles go, it's one of the most profound because it will show your shadow in brilliant contrast to, you know, again, the, the, the going the wrong way down a one way street. This is the book that'll turn you right around. And I actually just reread my type two days ago and I'm like, oh, back on track, you know, chiropractic adjustment of the soul. So I gave that to him, but highly recommend that book as well. By the way, another great Enneagram book. This one's uh, a favorite of Beth Cooper, who I interviewed all about the Enneagram uh, not long ago on the show. Uh, it's called The Complete Enneagram. Okay. 
Are you familiar with, with that book? I'm not. Who's do you, who's it by? by? Is it by Beth Cooper? It's by um, Beatrice Chestnut. Oh, I have another one of her books that I recommend in my course um, for business teams. But I, th- I think she's a brilliant writer on the topic. And so I imagine that, yeah, that book is probably also extraordinary. So you're a fan of the Enneagram. I was going to ask you about this, like personality profiles, besides, of course, doing purpose mapping what are your favorite sounds like enneagram is one of them i enneagram is the last one i do with people so often so if i'm working with a business team we'll do um wealth dynamics which shows you how you're designed to make the biggest contribution that'll get you paid colby which tells you how you get into action how you pop the clutch Uh, Myers-Briggs, which the one I use comes from Personality Hacker. I think they're brilliant. And they actually um, did a course with Beatrice Chestnut uh, because they are more uh, Myers-Briggs oriented. Their podcast is extraordinary as well for anybody that's into the, um, into Myers-Briggs, but they have a, a unique model that they use that shows the four cognitive functions, the primary auxiliary, tertiary, and inferior cognitive functions in a stack versus, you know, you're this type. Most people have it wrong. Once you see it in those four cognitive functions, it starts to click and make a lot more sense. And then I use the Enneagram. And then for people that really want to take a deep dive, we'll use some of the more uh, birthday-based stuff like um, facets of astrology that I have found very consistently blow people's minds uh, with how much they feel seen and understood. Something called human design, which is also an integrated system, which is if you have the right birth time, profound. I mean, it, it kind of sums up everything else. And then we do a 360 because we all have cognitive biases and blind spots. So even as we're reading our own typologies, we will miss things. So I ask for, you know, people in their lives to reflect anonymously so they can be honest. And then when we distill all that down, that's where we get the keywords that, you know, will repeatedly show up and end up in their essence, strengths, downfall and shadow quadrants. Are you familiar with print? No, what's print? That is an amazing personality profiling system. It's a, it's a favorite of Dan Sullivan, who, of course, uh, is the founder of Strategic Coach, and he's a big fan of Colby, K-O-L-B-E, by the way, for uh, those listeners who have not heard of Colby before. Print is all about the unconscious motivators and the triggers that get us into our shadow self. Wow. I got it. It is out. amazing. You will totally resonate. That's my jam. With that. Yeah, yeah. And also Deborah Levine, the co-creator of Print, was a guest on this podcast. So I'll include a link in the show notes to that particular episode. Right on. I want to check that out. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. That's right up my alley. Now, for somebody who's more materialistic, not that they're probably still listening, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they've probably been turned off in my show a long time before uh, this, but let's say somebody is uh, materialistic and they, they don't really buy this idea of birth time having anything to do with anything other than it just happened to be the time that you popped out. How does the birth time and birth date, birth location have anything to do with who you are and what you're meant to do in this lifetime and what sort of challenges you're going to face? So I have two answers to that. One is Carl Jung's answer, which is that astrology is all the wisdom of the, you know, uh, ancient universal wisdom, right? Because there's Vedic astrology from the Hindu uh, culture and there's, um, Uh, Chinese astrology, right? And then there's Western astrology and there's all sorts of different micro, you know, variations within all that. And he would say, just like the grapes of a certain vintage, right? They got a certain amount of rain, a certain amount of sun, a certain, you know, heat profile. And there's just a, a way that they're going to reflect that in the flavor of the wine, right? And so that's how Carl Jung would answer that question. My answer is, I really don't care. To me, it's just trust the process. By the time you get your one pager, you're not going to remember what words came from where. But if all of these systems are all saying the same thing about you, it's just a deeper, richer corroboration of that through line that starts to emerge from the scatter plots as you start to overlay the insights from each of these different personality profiles. So the reason that I would use, you know, as you said, Colby is, you know, how you get into action and uh, they, each of these things, they're looking at us from different angles, different facets. And astrology really adds a lot of texture and color to the structure that the more modern scientific 
personality types will show us. So to me, it, it really doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it. I don't even, you know, my best friend in college, world-class musician, he's traveled the world, you know, has a band now, but he's played in symphonies, all these sorts of things. And he, be, and he became a semi-professional astrologer, Scorpio. He's like all Scorpio, right? And we're driving around Kansas City. I don't know, this must've been almost 20 years ago. And he's explaining to me, we met in uh, quantum physics class in college. And then we played a whole bunch of Grateful Dead tunes out on the street. You know, he played violin and I played guitar and all this sort of thing. He was explaining astrology to me from an astronomical standpoint, right? The science side of what's actually happening in the sky with a retrograde and all these sort of things. You know, we drove around Kansas City for two hours. I think we were smoking a joint and, and we, you know, he finally pulls over, parks the car and he's like, anyways, dude, astrology is bullshit, right? So it's like, we can go into this whole, whole, it's like math, right? It's like, it's internally consistent, but once you pop out of it, you can look at it and be like, well, it's, you know, it's self-referential and uh, it kind of proves itself, but you can't prove it objectively. You just have to let it be what it is. But when we stack it with all of these other personality profiles and you start to see, holy shit, somehow it's getting me right as well. And it's adding a little bit of texture and color it becomes a welcome addition to the suite. My understanding of astrology and numerology is that nothing is random in this illusory reality. Nothing's random. And time and the place and the the circumstances of your birth, the fact that for you, uh, for example, you were adopted at birth, like this is all destiny. Mm. It's all predetermined. It's part of what is already written. Mektub in uh in Arabic, in, in the Quran, as it is written. So it's already written, and it, it serves as a map to hidden uh, secrets ab about your destiny and about your nature that you're dropped into in, in this particular lifetime. So that's my understanding of it. I learned something from Jamie Wheel, uh, who wrote Recapture the Rapture and Stealing Fire. He's an, he's an old colleague of mine from, from the Ken Wilber Integral uh, early days. And you know, one of the things that I like that he says is sometimes you just got to let the mystery be the mystery. You know, there's only so many explanations that are going to satisfy. And eventually we just have to surrender into something, go from intellect to intuition. And I know that that's important for you. I mean, you're an incredibly brilliant intellectual mind. It kind of runs out of uh, utility at a certain point and we stretch into something more. And that's where the intuition and the, and the mystery becomes more palpable. And so at that point, it's like, okay, you know, however this got here, whatever this is saying about me, there's something, there's something synchronistic and um, relevant. And then how does it live in me? And how can I utilize this to just reveal the light? And I only just recently, like last year, learned that synchronicity uh, was, is a, a term coined by Carl Jung. I think I sound the smartest and give the most value when I don't worry about my intellect and I just act like a receiver, like an FM receiver, like, like a dumb terminal and whatever I'm connected to the universal Google or whatever, right? The, uh, fabric of creation, uh, the collective consciousness mm -hmm. as uh, or collective unconscious as Carl Jung would call it is at my disposal. I can make a query with my dumb terminal mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, sound really smart by sharing something of high value that is not even mine. Yeah. I just tuned into it in the field, That's in the right. unified field. And you know, it's not even that woo woo. I mean, this is all a Napoleon Hill stuff. And Napoleon Hill was sort of the, um, he distilled down like what made, you know, Carnegie and uh, Edison and, you know, Firestone and all of these, you know, barons of, of uh, captains of industry, right? Super successful. And that's what they were all doing. We've lost that somehow, but it's all written down. It's all the literature, Emerson and, you know, America is a, is a nation of mystics. And we don't have to go back to 5,000 years ago in, in India or, or China to find profound mystical truths and revelations. It's right here in our language, in our culture, in modern times that we can relate to. It's really, really profound. In addition to Napoleon Hill, I also recommend Florence Scovel Shin. Okay, I haven't heard of them. Oh my goodness, she is amazing. Uh, she lived around the same time as Napoleon Hill. My favorite book of hers, the only one I've, I've fully read at this point, 
is called The Game of Life and How to Play It, published in 1925. I had that. I had that in my library. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Amazing book. Okay. She is like Neo in the Matrix. Wow. Cool. And this was, you know, over, this was 100 years ago. It's like mind blowing to think about it. You ever get into Wallace Waddles? No, I've heard of him, but the, I don't. There's a, there's a trilogy. It's The Science of Getting Rich the science of being great. And there's a third one. It's about health and you can get them all as like a, you know, all, all three in one hardcover book. Again, it's just mind blowing. Like how, you know, how does he know this stuff and how come this isn't just taught in schools across the country? Cause this is what would make America truly great again. It's, it's all but lost. So go and, you know, dig it up, dust it off and uh, dive in. I still listen to that stuff. I think the science of getting rich is probably only like two and a half hours on audible and it's free on audible just that one book mm. i probably listen to that three four five times a year still it's just it's the fundamentals i still listen to brian tracy dvds from decades ago yeah so good so good so good it's the fundamentals yeah. you know you can't go wrong awesome so if our listener wants to identify their purpose and their their shadow and the gold in that shadow go through your amazing process again where do they go so, and uh, how would they work with you? Sure. So go to purpose.ai slash optimized. And there's a, a little application. Everybody that applies gets access, but we're looking for, you know, sort of our ideal beta testers to be in more conversation with over time. Um, so that's how to get access to it. And they'll get the same course that you went through, right? Sort of the, the micro course version uh, with videos. And then there's a way to get a hold of me through there if they want to book a call and actually meet with me and get my support to come up with that one page plan like I did with you. My old website from before my sabbatical when I was living in New York is uh, is still up. It's at purposemapping.com and they're, they're also welcome to book a call through there, but check out purpose.ai. We're really, we're very, very excited about where that's going and we're looking for people that are likewise enthused and want to uh, experience it and give feedback and participate in helping to reach millions of people with this. Well, thank you, Craig. This is amazing. And what you've created is amazing. I'm floored with the process that you took me through and the insights that I was able to glean with your help. So thank you for that. And thank you for doing that for so many others. My pleasure. And it's my zone of genius. So it's what light me up and, uh, and I love it. Thank you for having me awesome. today. And uh, thanks for trusting me to go through that process. All right. And thank you, listener. Thank you for being open to these sorts of conversations. Now get out there and make it a great week. Reveal some light and we'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. <laughs>